Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. We're going to continue our reading and discussion of this most important book, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. And yesterday we concluded with more discussion, more detailed and explicit discussion about how the Pope exercises his temporal or kingly authority over Roman Catholics, not only in the United States, but all the nations of the world, and how he anathematizes any government that passes any laws that in any way hinder his governing authority over Roman Catholics. And the assertion that he is king of kings and lord of lords and government of governments, and that any government that thinks itself so bold as to in any way hinder his governing authority is to be stricken down. And Roman Catholics are relieved of any obligation to obey those laws and to assist the Pope in overthrowing that government and establishing papal supremacy in every country in the world. Now, R.W. Thompson doesn't make mere assertions. He backs it up with historical facts, examples in history, and that's what we're going to see. Now, backing up one, one paragraph for continuity purposes, we'll begin in the first full paragraph on page 169, if you're following along in the book. By the way, I think I've so far failed to mention that this book is uh, is uh, downloadable on my website under Research Books. So if you don't have a copy of this book, and many, many, many don't, because this is becoming a very rare book, uh, you can simply go to my website, inquisitionupdate.org, scroll down to uh, Research Books, and click on the link to the Papacy and the Civil Power, and you'll be directed to an online version. So with that, on page 169 of the book, the first full paragraph, it reads, Already the censures of the Pope rest upon whatsoever he finds in the civil policy of all the nations violative of the rights of the Roman Catholic Church, or of, quote-unquote, God's law, as he interprets it, as the Pope interprets it. The governments of Italy, Germany, Spain, Switzerland, and Brazil have deemed it expedient for their own domestic peace and protection to adopt certain measures which are designed, among other things, to require every citizen to obey the laws of the state and thereby to prevent sedition. It cannot be denied that they have the right to pass these laws by all the principles which nations recognize. They have relation to questions which concern their own domestic economy, questions which each nation has the exclusive right to decide for itself. The laws have been enacted in proper form and with the usual solemnity so that they should be considered as expressing in each case the will of the nation. Yet because they affect the interest of the Roman Catholic Church, have taken from some of its favorite orders a portion of their temporal wealth, have prohibited the prelates from teaching sedition, and have required them to conform to the law, the Pope has fulminated against these states the most terrible anathemas. They have invaded his spiritual jurisdiction, because the laws they have enacted, although in reference to temporalities, affect the affairs of the papacy, and weaken the papacy's power. Therefore, Pope Pius IX, professedly speaking, quote, in the name of Jesus Christ, and by the authority of the holy apostles Peter and Paul, unquote, admonishes the authors of these measures that they should, quote, take pity on their souls, unquote, and not continue to, quote, treasure up for themselves wrath against the day of wrath and of the revelation of the just judgment of God, unquote. And not only does he thus assume jurisdiction to denounce and to condemn the authors of these measures of civil policy and the measures themselves, but he compliments and applauds his, his, his adherence 
for their disobedience to those laws, although subjects of and owing allegiance to the governments enacting them. Speaking more particularly of the German Empire, he says this, quote, Nay, adding calumny and insult to their wrong, they are not ashamed to charge their raging persecution as the fault of Catholics because the prelates and clergy, together with the faithful, refuse to prefer the laws and orders of their civil empire to the most holy laws of their God and of their church, and so will not leave off their religious duty." Unquote. So there's how the Pope authoritatively and expressly congratulates Roman Catholics when they rise up against their civil laws to uphold the papal temporal authority in the country, to maintain the Pope as King of Kings and Lord of Lords in every nation. This is how the papacy, which every Roman Catholic is to believe is infallible and is the visible replacement of Christ upon the earth, how they must uphold, by any means necessary, his authority, both spiritual and temporal. See what a conflict this is to the nations of the world, to the governments of the world, and what a, what, what a conflict this arises, especially in a country that elevates the people to the power of government, like we do here in the United States as originally established. This is directly antagonistic to the temporal and spiritual authority of the Pope. Our form of government was most hated by the papacy, and still is today. And the war against this government to put down the constitutional guarantees that violate the papacy's self-arrogated domain is ongoing and is charging ever closer to a full overthrow of our government and a, and a replacement with a papal dictatorship. Now, R. W. Thompson continues, he says, and then he goes on to talk about these subjects who have refused to obey the laws of their state as, ex as exhibiting, quote-unquote, admirable firmness as having their, quote, loins girt about with truth, unquote, as wearing, quote, the breastplate of justice, as, dismay as, as dismayed by no dangers, discouraged by no hardships, as carrying on the combat for the church, for the papacy, and for its sacred rights valiantly and earnestly, and as presenting the power of a compact unity. In other words, there's a full-on war taking place between Roman Catholics and their own government. They're civilly disobedient at the behest of the Pope. Such controversy like that ever arising in the United States would be enough to topple it. Roman Catholicism is very powerful in this country. And when you give it, understand that Catholics generally run about 25% of the population, but when you throw upon the papal uh, authority the acquiescence of the ecumenical evangelical bellies in this country, they're a vast majority. The Pope has tremendous influence in Washington, D.C., because he now, now, he now not only represents Roman Catholics, but he represents the lion's share of those that used to call themselves Protestant. So who's left? Not many. And they will be de de determined by the Pope and his followers and his ecumenical evangelical belly followers as enemies of the state. Because now the power of the state has moved from Protestantism to Roman Catholicism. The country is being Catholicized, just as R.W. Thompson feared, just as he warned, and it goes on almost without opposition in this country. 
under the the laudable name of unity, Christian unity. Who who could ever be against Christian unity? When it's put to the to uninformed Americans in those terms, we have no opposition to this Christian unity. When in fact it is unity under the authority of the Pope and the eventual overthrow of our Protestant government and our Protestant religion. Bible believing Christianity is the last hope for this country. And when it's gone, papal tyranny will take its place. Now he says, Thus he gives this pontifical sanction and approval to what every nation on earth considers disloyalty, but what he considers right and justifiable, because the obnoxious laws, although in reference to temporal affairs, impair his pontifical rights and consequently violate the law of God as he interprets them. He insists that his spiritual scepter extends over all these nations and that he has the right to release their citizens from their proper allegiance to their domestic laws whenever, in his opinion, those laws shall encroach upon his own personal rights or the rights of the church as he shall declare them and he thereby furnishes a practical application of his theory of this spiritual power, which is neither more nor less than a denial to the state of any jurisdiction over even temporal matters, when in his judgment they concern religion, the church, the papacy, or anything within the unlimited domain of faith and morals. In other words... He's King of kings and Lord of lords. And he commands the people by divine right. And if he commands them to overthrow the government, to disobey its laws, that's what he will do. And that's what they will obey. Now these papal censures rest, of course, most heavily upon such nations and peoples as have declared by their forms of their by the forms of their civil institutions and government that the church shall have no share whatever in matters pertaining to the civil jurisdiction or in the government of temporalities. All such nations have, according to him, committed the sin of infidelity, which they aggravate when they require his Roman Catholic priestly hierarchy to obey all the laws and refuse them permission, as in Germany, Italy, Spain, Switzerland, and Brazil, to set up an ecclesiastical empire within the state with a foreign prince to rule it. Now, here we have, I'm going to emphasize once again, R.W. Thompson has told us in the clearest possible terms that the Roman Catholic hierarchy in this country, the priests and prelates of the Roman Catholic Church, the bishops, the cardinals, the archbishops, have set up a, a shadow government, hidden in plain sight, and it's ruled over by a foreign prince who's not bound by our laws and constitutions. No, he is not only not bound, but he is adamantly opposed to them, the Pope of Rome. Now, you hear a lot of people talk about the shadow government, but how many of them dare even mention what this shadow government is? They come off as being so highly intellectual in talking about this shadow government as though they know what it is, but they don't know what it is. The shadow government is the Roman Catholic Church and its Roman Catholic hierarchy. Just as Avril Manhattan in his book, The Vatican Billions, has so clearly taught us. Now, among these nations that are rebellious against the Pope, the United States occupies the most prominent position, says R.W. Thompson. Our government has always preserved in maintaining measures which the Popes have considered prejudicial to the interests and welfare of the Roman Catholic Church and has always denied the authority which they claim to belong to them 
by divine right. By means of these and kindred matters, we have, in the eyes of the papacy, become egregious offenders. The papacy regards the United States as an egregious offender of his rights, of his divine rights. We have made our institutions infidel and heretical. We have refused to accept the papal policy of government in preference to our own. We have kept the state above the church in all matters concerning temporalities. We have failed to give any form of ecclesiasticism the support of law, or to confer any exclusive privileges upon the Roman Catholic hierarchy. Hence, the followers of the Pope are availing themselves of our Protestant toleration, freedom of religion, in order to assure him, that is, the Pope, by assailing such principles of our government as he has condemned, how completely they have submitted their intellects and wills to his dictation. In other words, 25% of the population, the Roman Catholic population of this country, has submitted to the Pope's dictation. As I've said on the program so many times before, a Roman Catholic, a devout Roman Catholic, is first and foremost a citizen and a subject of the Vatican. He is their spiritual head, and he is their temporal head. So wherever a Roman Catholic exists in the world, he is a foreigner to the nation in which he resides. A fifth column in place in every nation of the world that can be raised to action by the mere stroke of a finger by the Pope to resist and to overthrow existing institutions established by the people to maintain liberty. And they may rise up, they must rise up and overthrow that liberty and impose papal tyranny. That's their first loyalty. And they're bound by spiritual commitments to it. Excommunication of the church results from those who resist the temporal power of the Pope. And every Roman Catholic stands in fear of being excommunicated because to them, the Roman Catholic Church is the one holy Roman Catholic and apostolic church, the one church established by Jesus Christ through Peter, who the Pope is the successor. And to be excommunicated from that church is to be excommunicated from the heavenly kingdom. Salvation is lost. Damnation is assured. The flames of purgatory will never be quenched, that they'll continue on their path to hell when it's over. So fear of excommunication is paramount in the life of every Roman Catholic. And the keys to hell are held by their Pope, and they must obey him. Right or wrong, they must obey him. Whether he violates their conscience or not, they are committed by their spiritual life to obey him and resist their own governments. Therefore, it can be understood clearly that the gravest threat to our Protestant constitutional republic is an enemy within, a domestic terrorist, a Roman Catholic, who answers only to the Pope when push comes to shove, Now, R.W. Thompson continues, he says, Not having been permitted thus far to restore the temporal power of the Pope at Rome, remember this is the time when Victor Emmanuel rode in and took the temporal crown off the Pope's head and put it on his own. You will no longer be a king. I'm the king of Rome, says Emmanuel. You can be a a, a preacher and a priest and continue to... Pastor your flock, your Roman Catholic flock, but they will obey me, because I'm now the king. So at a time when the Pope's power is most effectively threatened in his very own town, Rome, Italy, 
he is threatened all over Europe with the same treason as the Pope would see it, now seeks to declare himself infallible and arrest the movement of nations to accept to reject their new temporal kings and to restore the papacy and his kings in power, the monarchs of Europe. He says, having been permitted thus far to restore the temporal power of the Pope at Rome, having been have not having been permitted thus far to restore the temporal power of the Pope at Rome, and maddened by his downfall to an extreme degree of violence, they have converted a large part of their church literature into denunciatory assaults upon our constitutions and laws, possibly with the hope that when their work of exterminating Protestantism has ended, a holy empire with the Pope as its sovereign may rise upon the ruins of our free institutions. They went on the attack in America. The Roman Catholic hierarchy went on the, the attack in America. The end game was a divine institution of the papacy to replace our government. Because the United States has not raised the Pope to temporal authority, because the United States has not granted to the Roman Catholic priests immunity from the civil law and given them special privileges, because the government of the United States has not united church and state, because the government of the United States has upheld the liberty of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, freedom of the press, all these Protestant institutions, the papacy has used Roman Catholics to fight back to help destroy these Protestant institutions to enforce the, pap the papacy's infallibility in this country, to little by little overthrow our government and to put the Pope at its head. And hence, because we have not made America Catholic, the followers of the Pope are availing themselves of our Protestant toleration, freedom of religion, in order to assure the Pope, by assailing such principles of our government as he has condemned, how completely they have submitted their intellects and wills to his dictation. Not having been permitted thus far to restore the temporal power of the Pope at Rome, and maddened by his downfall to an extreme degree of violence, they have converted a large portion of their church literature, Roman Catholic church literature, into denunciatory assaults upon our Constitution and laws, possibly with the hope, says R. W. Thompson, that when their work of exterminating Protestantism has ended, a holy empire with the Pope as its sovereign may rise upon, rise upon the ruins of our free institutions. Another Another proof that R. W. Thompson can, comprehended before it was ever given the name New World Order, R. W. Thompson comprehended what the New, or, New World Order would be. A simply a resurrection of the Old World Order. Papal tyranny. Monarchies. Papal monarchies heading over every government in the, in the world. Now, while with one breath they tell us that it is false to say they desire the Pope to interfere with our civil affairs, with the next breath they assail our Constitution and insolently declare that we do not ourselves understand what its fundamental principles are. They actively employ their untiring energies and acute intellects in the work of reconstructing our government so as to turn over to the ecclesiastical jurisdiction, that is, the Roman Catholic priest and the, and the spiritual authority of the Pope, the very matters which our fathers intentionally removed from it, notwithstanding that removal has thus far in our history contributed 
in an eminent degree our, to our strength and progress as a nation. Examples of this are far more numerous than is generally supposed. The relations between the Pope and his hierarchical adherents are so intimate and direct that he has but to that he has but to give the word of command, and they become immediately emulous of each other in the exhibition of their obedience and submission. In other words, they pay him homage, and when it is the when the subject of their interest becomes elevating the Pope, they compete with one another. They become emulous of one another. Who can best and most effectively destroy our institutions and, re and elevate the Pope? It becomes a contest. Now, his voice, that is the voice of the Pope, they consider to be the voice of God. And wheresoever he requires them to strike... There they direct their blows. They rest neither night nor day, for the vigilance of the Jesuit never sleeps, and nothing can extinguish his hatred of religious liberty. So R. W. Thompson has told us explicitly, the head of this charge against our Protestant institutions is the Jesuit order. Every one of them has no loyalty whatsoever to our country. Their full and complete loyalty is to the black pope, and the black pope's first and only allegiance is to elevate the papacy to world supremacy and to suppress Protestantism, to extinguish Protestantism from off the earth, and every institution that rose out of the Protestant Reformation. R. W. Thompson points his finger directly at the Jesuit order for leading this assault against the Protestant institutions of the United States and, and the entire republic. They are the ones who made the Pope infallible. They are the ones who interjected this papal infallibility. They are the ones who assembled the First Vatican Council where the papal infallibility decree was issued. And by this they've united all Roman Catholics. Now, if the Pope is infallible, and his in, and his teachings are being, and his temporal power is, is 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 diminished by the the government of the United States, then it is the Jesuit order that provides the force necessary to put down that resistance. And there area of operations is in politics, and Washington, D.C. is the battleground. Now, R. W. Thompson continues. He says, the Catholic world, in the number of September of 1871, this is a Catholic publication, in September of 1871, contains a leading article entitled, The Reformation, Not Conservative. It appears so soon after the Pope's encyclical of that year that it must have been intended as a response to his fervid anticipations of ultimate sovereignty over the world. The author professes to accept the Constitution of the United States, quote, as originally understood and intended, unquote, that is, as he interprets it, in a sense which denies the sovereignty of the people or that of the government holds from them, or is responsible to them. He repudiates entirely and with indignation the Protestant principle from which this popular sovereignty is derived, because he considers it to be Jacobinism. And from these premises, he reaches the following disloyal conclusions in reference to our Constitution. Quote, but as it is interpreted by the liberal and sectarian journals that are doing their best to revolutionize it, and is beginning to be interpreted by no small portion of the American people, or is interpreted by the Protestant principle, so widely diffused among us, and in the sense of European liberalism and Jacobinism, we do not accept it, or hold it to be any government at all or as capable of performing any of the proper functions of government. 
And if it continues to be interpreted by the revolutionary principle of Protestantism, it is sure to fail to lose itself either in the supremacy of the mob or in military despotism and doom us like unhappy France to alternatives between them with the mob uppermost today and despot tomorrow. Protestantism, like the heathen barbarisms which Catholicity subdues, lacks the element of order because it rejects authority, that is, the authority of the Pope, and is necessarily incompetent to maintain real liberty in civilized society. Hence it is we so often say that if the American Republic is to be sustained and preserved at all, it must be by the rejection of the principles of the Protestant Reformation and the acceptance of the Catholic principle by the American people. Protestantism can preserve neither liberty from running into license and lawlessness nor authority from running into despotism. Unquote. So in the Pope's mind, the survival of the United States is the, the downfall of Protestantism and the elevation of the papacy. That's how they see it. Every Roman Catholic is instructed that this government is heretical because it's Protestant. And it is their moral, spiritual, and temporal duty to overthrow it. Now, he says, what is here meant by such expressions as the Protestant principle, the revolutionary principle of Protestantism, and the principle of the Reformation? Manifestly this. They are used as equivalent terms to express the same idea, that our government derives its power from the people, who in the revolutionary contest with monarchy which followed the Reformation successfully resisted the divine right of the king of kings and entered upon the experiment of governing themselves until this revolution began they had no voice in the management of public affairs and were not consulted about the laws kings governed by divine right and the papacy under the same claim of right was one of the great if not the greatest controlling powers in the world but new light was shed by the Protestant Reformation, and new forms of government began to arise. Protestantism, being its natural fruit, had its influence in their formation, and inasmuch as all its teachings and tendencies inculcate the elevation of individuals and the progress of society, this divine right of government was denied, and the right of self-government established. The authority of kings was dispensed with, and the authority of the people substituted for it. No institutions in the world guard and guarantee this great principle better than ours here in the United States. The Constitution declares it in uh, the Constitution declares it in its preamble, and protects it and protects it in all its parts. The most efficient means of protection afforded by it are found especially in those provisions which prohibit an establishment of religion and the creation of privileged classes and provide for equality of citizenship and rights, the universality of law, the freedom of conscience, and of speech, and of the press. These are the Protestant and revolutionary principles to which this author refers. They are the former because they are opposed to the principles of the papacy. The latter because they place the authority of the government in the hands of the people rather than those of a monarch. By our fathers who established the government, by all those who have been entrusted with its management from the beginning, and by the great body of the people of the United States, our Constitution has been always and invariably interpreted in the light of these principles and facts. We have differed among ourselves about many things, but not about these great principles. 
and we now cherish them nonetheless because it required revolution to establish them. This papal writer is not so ignorant as to be uninformed about our history. He tells us, however, that as we understand and interpret our Constitution, he, though professedly an American citizen, will not accept it, that it is no government at all, a mere rope of sand, and not capable of performing any of the proper functions of government. If he took the, the oath of allegiance to it in the Protestant sense, he must have cherished treason in his heart against it at the time. If he took it in any other sense, he permitted perjury, or excuse me, he committed perjury in the eyes of the law. Be this as it may, he stands now before the country as the professed enemy of the great fundamental principles which the Constitution was designed to per perpetuate. And what are the avowed grounds of his op opposition? These are nothing less that the right of self-government in the people is only the supremacy of the mob, that a government founded upon that right lacks the element of order and cannot maintain liberty or society because it rejects authority. What authority? The authority of kings and those who govern by divine right. The people, said Dr. Brownson, as we saw earlier in the book, were born to be governed, not to govern. They need a master. And this writer instructs us where we may find such a master. Quote, By the rejection of the principles of the Protestant Reformation and the acceptance of the Roman Catholic principle. Unquote. Then authority will triumph the right of self-government will be gone, the divine right be reestablished, the fundamental principles of our government will be lost forever, we shall have an established church and a privileged hierarchy and no more freedom of conscience, of speech, and of the press. The papacy will win its grand triumph and the pope become our master." But the questions we're discussing do not involve the necessity of dwelling upon these consequences which are not likely to be visited upon us unless some power shall arise sufficiently overwhelming to arrest the career of national progress. They have to do rather with the position of the papal defenders in this country, the motives which influence them and the principles upon which they justify their combined assault upon institutions to which, in their present form, the greater part of them have taken oaths of allegiance. R. W. Thompson just spelled out for him, uh, for us, that our greatest threat is a domestic threat, not a foreign threat, not a foreign fleet, not a foreign army, but a a nation that exists within this nation that answers only to a foreign potentate, the Pope. R. W. Thompson just told us in his eloquent language that we have only one thing to fear, that domestic threat, the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic hierarchy, and the papacy. And Pope Pius IX and his successors ever since are leading that assault. Since the decree of papal infallibility, the Pope has infallibly led Roman Catholicism to nibble away at our free institutions and to gradually convert this, this country to Roman Catholicism. Now, Wherein does the difference consist in principle between them, <clears throat> the Roman Catholics of this country, and those citizens of Germany who have so highly extolled for their resistance to the laws of their government? Remember, the Catholics were instructed in Germany to overthrow their government. He's going to give us some particulars. He says... 
the particular measure of civil policy which have invited the resistance are not alike, are, are not alike but the principle is the same in all cases. It is neither more nor less than opposition to law because it affects the church by denying that the Pope has any right, either divine or human, to interfere with the domestic and temporal policy of the government. The Pope claims that by virtue of authority conferred upon him by divine providence, he has the spiritual right to release these disobedient citizens of Germany from their allegiance to their own government, and that any resistance to this by that government is a violation of God's law. The Pope teaches that their first duty is to him, because he represents God, and that if, in paying this duty, they violate the laws of their state, they stand justified before God, because the spiritual order is above the temporal. And thus he erects an ecclesiastical government within the temporal. There's your shadow government demanding obedience upon the ground that God did not design that the Pope should be subject to any civil power on earth. He holds out the same justification to his followers in the United States, encouraging their opposition to principles of our government far more fundamental than any assailed in Europe and rested upon the same claim of divine power. As vicar of Christ, he dispenses the obligation of, of allegiance and turns loose his ecclesiastical army upon every government on the earth which dares to establish any constitution or pass any law or do any act that shall curtail his authority or that of his hierarchy or shall prevent the papacy from be becoming what he claims for it, the universal governing power. The writers, like the author of the foregoing article in the Catholic world, perf uh, perfectly obedient and submissive to the Pope, enter with alacrity upon the task of assailing the very fundamental principles of our government. As if the... Okay, apparently having some te technical difficulties again this morning. Apologize for that. Uh, unavoidable. I don't know where I got cut off, but... Um, I will just begin at the top of the page 176 for our final few minutes here on the program. As vicar of Christ, the Pope dispenses the obligation of allegiance and turns loose his ecclesiastical army, his priests, upon every government on the earth which dares to establish any constitution or pass any law or do any act that shall curtail his authority or that of his hierarchy or shall prevent the papacy from becoming what he claims for it, the universal governing power. The writers, like the author of the foregoing article in the Catholic world, perfectly obedient and submissive to the Pope, enter with alacrity upon the task of assailing the very fundamental principles of our government, as if the American people were insensible to their perfidy or ready to become passive dupes of their intrigues, passive dupes of their intrigues. That describes Americans today. Passive dupes to papal intrigues. This ecumenical movement and the unity of all Christians is just a cloak for the most diabolical destruction of Protestantism that has ever assailed this nation. And if we do not see it and repent of it, this country is toast. R. W. Thompson had it right. In 1876, it's inexcusable that Americans are ignorant of this today. We'll continue with the reading and discussion of this book Monday, tomorrow, Richard Bennett. We'll see you tomorrow.